All right. So. All right, we are now tuned in. You are now tuned in to the 18th annual Happily Natural. Uh, wow. So we're moving. Give thanks for Brother Kalanji John Machanga uh, from the FTP movement. Uh, I hope you took some notes. You know, I mean, the reality is, is that we need more we need tangible direct action that's married to public policy you know the reality is we got a lot of public policy but we don't be having a lot of direct action in our community and that's 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 yeah. something that we need to fix um so today next up to uh <laughs> up, to, up to uh next up to back so to speak is a. Uh, Really good brother that I've met over the last couple of years, uh, brother named Michael Carter of Carter Farms and also Africulture. Um, he's going to be rocking with us today. Uh, but hold on, before I do that, let me make sure. Hold on. Uh, let me see. Is my folks from Wild Seed? Are y'all on, on the call? I guess not. So let me meet them. I'm going to bring you up, brother. What's good with you? What's good with you? Oh, man, I'm doing good. Um, so far, so good, man. Uh, you know, we had to deal with a little bit of turbulence in the beginning. But now the, the, the plane is, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're in the air. And we're, you know. <laughs> We're, we're on point to our destination. So it feels good. <laughs> no microwave militancy. Yeah, look. <laughs> I, I love that, brother. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's analysis. Yeah. You know, a, a pilot. Um, yeah, so yeah, we, we yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you on the call today. Uh, you know, we're doing, um, you know, this is, the, this is the 18th annual Happily Natural Day. And, uh, you know, having you on here today is really a great marriage of the, the work around African identity and uh, sustainable agriculture that we've uh, evolved into over, you know, the last uh, 10 years or so, right? Um, so it's kind of interesting, you know what I mean, that we would be doing this in a virtual forum, uh, <laughs> considering how uh, uh, hands-on uh, the work uh, uh, is when we when we're talking about the ag, we're talking about ag and, and farming and and growing, but uh, I'm I'm thankful nonetheless to have you here to share it with us. And so I'm I'm presuming that you have you know uh, like a, some sort of PowerPoint or something like that that you want to share or or what's up. I got one. I ain't know how he's going. I, I watched the other uh, presenters. I'm like, okay, well, I, I did too much. Well, we <laughs> just have a beautiful I, conversation. I, I don't know, Kalani. I don't know if Kalanji had a PowerPoint or not. Maybe I should have asked him. <laughs> 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 right into the mix, but uh, I do want to give you an opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to 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 share. Hold on, let me see. Uh, You should be able to share if you have one. Now. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I was enjoying the, the other presenters. And I was like, man, I'm that geek that did too much play. So I'm like, <laughs> no, nah, man. Hey, look, I, like, give it up, give, give it all you got. Because <laughs> <laughs> all like, these chime like, in, I ain't trying to make this lecture. I had, I had a PowerPoint. I was like, I thought my sister Amaris was going to be able to get on the call because she was having some Wi-Fi issues. I was about to whip my joint. I was like, yeah, I'm about to, I'm about to do my old thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, you, you got it, man. I, I know you got some stuff that you want to uh, put up. 
put forward to the people? Well, I mean, I think in light of this, and even before I begin, giving honor and recognition to the ancestors and the elders who came before us, on whose shoulders that we stand, <clears throat> that without them and their sacrifice and their, everything they've done, we wouldn't be here to have a conversation. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I'm listening, you know, and kind of just going over my head how I wanted to share, what I wanted to share. Um, and it became a telling thing of, you know, what I always hear at these most conferences um, with us. But before I begin that, I'll just share briefly what is Afroculture. And Afroculture is a Virginia-based 501c3 nonprofit that highlights, discovers, honors, and enhances people of African descent and their contributions to agriculture. Um, and I go into my history a little bit beforehand, uh, before returning back to the United States from Ghana uh, in 2017, I was known as Ben Orb in Israel of the African Hebrew Israelite community uh, in the ministry of their divine agriculture. And, uh, you know, I, I lived at least 15 of my years of my life under that name and understanding. Um, based in D.C., uh, but then in Israel and then later on in Ghana for five years from 2012 to 2017, repatriated with no plans of ever returning back to America. But yet here I am. And what I hear a lot or what I've heard a lot, you know, is what we need to do. <laughs> that always frustrated me uh, in various conferences and you know, circumstances of conversations of folks of consciousness of sorts. Uh, like yourself, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years easy, uh, if not longer. Uh, and just raising consciousness. Before we were woke, we were conscious. You know, long after this woke thing changes, we'll still be conscious. And we study those elders, those ancestors who sat at their feet. Um, and, you know, we, I always like to give honor and praise to those individuals as well who's Paved that, way, paved that way in terms of knowledge and understanding um, to get us to this point. But the first thing we need to do is know we're at war. And as you know, the brother before me was stating, I mean, which is very clear, even the first uh, sister that was speaking, very, we are at war. You know, and we've been at war since June 18th, 1452. And if that date doesn't ring a bell to you, look it up. That was the official papal patent from Pope Nicholas V, given to Alfonso V of Portugal, who instructed Henry the Navigator to pretty much make non-white people perpetual servants. And it's pretty much saying that the, at that time, the Saracens and the pagans were to be put into servitude. And it started the initial launch into enslavement of African people on the west coast of Africa. With him and the navigator kidnapping uh, several individuals and bringing them back to Portugal. And we've been at a war ever since. And these last, you know, I'm sure this last year has been a lot for a lot of people. But the last 500 years have been a lot for us. We've just made it normal. We've normalized it, made it acceptable, and kind of lived with it without any, made it look easy. So now the other folks are having experience uh, effects of their rights and liberties and freedom of movement. Now to think 2020 is now on trash. Well, 2020 is the same as 2019, 2018, 19 for us Africans in this country. But again, what we need to do is buy and support black farmers. That should be the first thing that we work to do on a regular basis is support our black farmers. Uh, they need our help. We boycotted them for the last 100 and some odd years, at least the last 100 years, uh, where we didn't support them. We made it so that they couldn't make their vocation a business. And we vacated them to the point that now we're an endangered species. I'm a fifth generation farmer. Fifth generation free farmer of sorts on our own land. 
prior to that, my, my family has been doing agriculture against their will for at least 11 generations. Since the early 1745 to potentially 1622. So we've been doing agriculture for a long time. And I'm probably the worst farmer of all my ancestors, all my lineage. But I understand the importance of supporting black farmers. And I've been doing this pretty much all my life because I had no choice. And one of the key things in supporting black farmers is changing your diet. And that changing in terms of what you eat, but how you eat. And I guess it would be what you eat as well. Many of products, these products are made from corn, soybeans, cotton, cotton seed, um, sh sugar, all sorts, uh, rape seed or canola oil. All of these products are generally grown by larger non-black farmers. So ideally, when you're eating these non-processed foods, you're definitely supporting a larger agricultural complex that's not in your interest or your favor, that's causing the disease that creates things like colon cancers in, in our people. You know, and I bring colon cancers up because uh, the dear death of our brother Chadwick, who, you know, social media, I mean, definitely brings things to your doorfront. You know, we were all, I'm sure, skimming through Facebook sometime or Instagram and you get a post saying he died. I'm like, what the heck? of colon cancer, you know, and most of us, I know, I speak for myself, my father had colon cancer, his brothers had colon cancer, his cousins had colon cancer, my uncles, my great uncles, all had colon cancer at some point. Either killed from it or had to get some type of surgery, removing their colon to sustain themselves. But in my family, and what's the big epidemic is what and how we eat, eating processed food, processed meats, uh, they ultimately, give you health issues with your colon uh, in terms of how you digest and you eliminate your foods. Um, the next thing we have to do in supporting black ag black farmers is consume more fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables in season, ideally locally. We've gotten spoiled with eating bananas all year round in a country that doesn't grow banana, any bananas that we actually eat. Banana is the... <clears throat> most popular, most consumed fruit in the United States. Yet the only place you can grow them is ideally California and Florida. And we don't, we import all of the bananas that we eat for the oh, most. Oh, I just some more. Let's see. More Morgan. Send it to Morgan, send it to the mother. There's no one with us? We good? <laughs> you good? Go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. So consuming more fresh vegetables in season, I mean, it's critical. You know, and give you a little intake about or insight about black farmers. Black farmers have a limited window of growth in terms of when they grow. We generally grow from April, May to about October. Uh, when the first freeze comes, it usually kills everything. And in that process, when you look at supply and demand is you're growing fruits and vegetables. Let's say right now or next week or two, there's gonna be a plethora of sweet corn coming up, at least in Virginia. And it varies based upon demographic and um, environmental factors in the various states our farmers are growing in. But it's gonna be a whole lot of sweet corn coming out. And with the supply issues of uh, supply and demand, when there's a large influx of supply, the price generally goes down. So last month, you may have saw a lot of tomatoes come in the market. Black farmers got tomatoes, white farmers got tomatoes, supermarkets got tomatoes, and now tomatoes are coming in and they're coming in at 50 cents a pound. So we're losing because we're having to compete against others. Like a home, these things require income. And it requires us to be able to support our, our farmers and institutions so that they can sustain themselves for five generations, for six generations, for seven generations, which requires us to provide them with our dollar line, or as I would say. Um, we vote with our dollars. That's the biggest vote voting day that you have is every day that you go out and spend money. 
you're telling someone that you want them to stay in business. You want to support them with your dollars and you're showing that in real time and real action. It's not a casting a vote, vote or a ballot and then hoping that someone who's elected will keep your interest. Every day that you go out and you spend money with whomever you spend money with, you're supporting them and showing them that you want them to stay in business. You're supporting their efforts for they can sustain and pay their bills tomorrow so that they can <clears throat> stay in business for as long as you continue to support them. But black farmers don't always get that because many times when it comes to produce, we look for the, late, the lowest price. Walmart, I think, is the big largest seller of fresh produce in the country. You know how many black farmers sell to Walmart? Zippy. <laughs> I want. So it's at least not that I know of. In Virginia, especially. I know farmers who grow for Walmart and the likes, they're not black. The type of operations you have to be able to grow for those individuals is massive. Um, so when you're supporting, you know, those institutions, when you're going through Amazon to buy vegetables, when you're going through the grocery stores to buy vegetables, uh, be very mindful that when you're buying them and you don't know who they're coming from, potentially it's not a black farmer. Um, so support those farmers in your area. If you don't know, there's plenty of directories online to help you out. If you're in Virginia, please contact me or Duran. We can point you to pretty much black farmers in every locale in this state. Um, to support them, they need your help, they need your support, they need your dollars. The next thing we need to do is grow something. Get our hands back in the soil. Right now, food has been used as a weapon. And if you're familiar with Henry Kissinger and his USDA, Glo uh, US Global 2000 uh, memo, he was saying, we're gonna use food as a weapon. If you go back 100 years before then, Frederick Douglass said it was food was used as a weapon. Booker T. Washington understood that and said, you know what, we're going to weaponize this food for ourselves. Weaponize this weapon for ourselves. And that's what he did. And that's you know ultimately what Tuskegee became and George Washington Carver and Booker T. Wiley and others really showed us how to grow something, sustain ourselves through our food. And even our grandmothers, you know, as I'm going back to the, the, the previous slide there about supporting black farmers, our grandmothers, our aunties, they understood the value of what black farmers were producing. And they started to can the surplus of vegetables that, to make sure it would sustain them, but also to support the farmers so that nothing would go to waste. The biggest challenge that black farmers have is during you know, times of plenty, it's a glut where you don't get enough money to make it worthwhile to sell or to give away, you may give it away and then it's still waste at a food hub, at a food bank, or you know, in somebody's refrigerator or on somebody's counters. But coming back to how to preserve this food via canning, which is not difficult. You can YouTube it to see how it's done. It's very easy. Um, and it pays off both with food security uh, and as well as supporting black farmers, especially during this time between now and probably next month, when there'll be an influx of produce coming from farms throughout this region. And when you're growing something, especially the first time growing, second time growing, failure is not an option. You're going to fail. Accept it. It's going to not come out maybe the way you wanted it to. It doesn't mean you don't try, you don't continue to do it again and again until you get it right. Farmers fail all the time. You know how many times I'm planting some seeds and they didn't germinate, they didn't come up. You know, insects got them, they got hit by a fungus. I forgot to harvest or harvest it too late. These are things that happen, but it shouldn't discourage you from growing something because you know, the those individuals who kidnapped us, they kidnapped us with a specific of understanding who we were and what we brought to the table. And many of us were agriculturists and had a great understanding of agriculture even for those who don't necessarily subscribe to us being brought from Africa, those individuals who were here, the indigenous folks here of African descent and others, they were agriculturalists. They knew how to grow. They knew how to live within harmony of the earth within their season and their time. We hear often about the three sisters, squash, corn, and beans, and the indigenous individuals here, nations here growing that staples. 
They understood that. They grew something within season. They didn't care about it failing. They put it in the soil knowing that something was going to come up. It's another level of faith and spirituality that comes from working with the soil. And when you're growing something, do it barefoot, especially if you're outside. That earth can hear you, it can feel you, it can understand you, your vibrations, your energy, however you want to describe it, but it picks up your, it picks you up when you're barefoot. Let the earth feel you, let you feel the earth. And it's such a great de stress especially in these times when individuals are not as equipped maybe to deal with stresses. And there seems to be an influx of stresses coming upon us on a regular basis. The next thing we need to do is become a farmer. Becoming a farmer is much easier than you may think. And this requires an application at your nearest local USDA office and applying to become a farmer. It costs you nothing. All you have to do is say, I'm a farmer. That means if you're in an apartment, if you're in a condo, if you're in a single family home, if you're in a trailer, it doesn't matter. You can live in an apartment and grow in a container. You can grow microgreens. You can grow in old salad trays. You can grow. And if you're growing, you can become registered as a farmer. This has a tremendous effect uh, in terms of one, getting our black farmer numbers up. Uh, right now, nationwide, they, they say we have about 45,000 black farmers in the state of Virginia. Uh, we have about 1,700 black farmers. Uh, in reality, in both of those things, it's probably 50% of those actual farmers, individuals who actually work the land and till the land and produce a crop. Many of those other individuals are landowners. But there's a benefit to being a farmer in this country. If we know the foundation of this, <clears throat> individuals white landowners. The key word land and own land, you be able to turn it, it will become farm numbers so you can get the many, many benefits that USDA offers in terms of being a black farmer or just a farmer in general. During the COVID PPP time and even up to now, I think September 11th, September 8th deadline, uh, the USDA is offering check for farmers who've had any type of agreement in, in their crop. Um, I got my check. <laughs> There's a lot of individuals who receive a lot larger checks than what I'll get. Um, we increase our farmers and, and take pride in that and then benefit from the privileges of being a farmer in this country. There are tax breaks when you have a farm, tremendous tax breaks. It allows you to keep your income and, and credit into other areas that you may need or want. And it doesn't require anything but an application to the USDA FSA office. But if you go to USDA.gov or farmers.gov, you can get directed to your local office. And within five to 10 minutes, you can have the application completed. And then after that, you can have a farm number. If you decide not to do anything with that, then okay. It has more benefits than you may realize. Um, and especially if you do have some land uh, that you're not using or family land, et cetera that into a farm, having a farm number can reduce your taxes on that land tremendously. Um, you can get a, you can become a forest farmer. They say you're growing trees and whatever wild trees you're growing is what you're growing. But there's a lot of opportunities in becoming, being a black farmer. Just a farm in general. The next thing we do is not to do that. We have to buy from black business for everything possible. These are things that has to be done to sustain us, especially during these times of instability, of racial tension, racial biases, et cetera. Support our black businesses. And don't just support them during Kwanzaa, during Juneteenth. Don't just support the cultural ones. Support the banks, support the insurance companies, support the real estate offices, the, fund, the CPAs, the accountants, the farmers. You know, the nonprofits support all of them with your money. Again, your money, your dollars are vote. Every time you put your money toward anything, you're voting for them to stay in the business. How many of us know of any uh, 
Asian carryout that's went out of business in our communities? How many of us know of any hair salons that's went out of business or our hair salons, but beauty care industries owned by Asians that went out of business? We support them continually with our dollars in our communities. I ain't never known, well, I've known a few liquor stores that go out of business, but not a lot. This is and our money, and our money, especially for those who are trying to do something great, provide services for and about our people. They may support others, but they're also there to help you out. They have to give you a sense of relatability with our customers, I mean, with, with our businesses and with customers. I love to go into business to be able to drop you know, a couple hundred dollars in a business and just, I feel good. I feel good knowing I've helped out a small business continue to stay in business because a, a vote for them is a vote against someone else, but not voting for them with your dollars would definitely put them in a situation of potentially going out of business themselves. Deposit money in black banks. This is the second thing that comes after you start supporting black businesses. We have to deposit as well. What an author um, wrote a book called The Black Tax Cost, PhD, Purchase Higher and Deposit. Purchase from black businesses, and that purchasing with black businesses allows black businesses to hire individuals in their community to support their business. And many times you hire who you know, you hire people within your network, especially when you're a small business. And our network's gonna be who? Us, people in our community young people who may need jobs. And once those individuals start depositing more money in the black banks, they can provide more loans and more opportunities for other businesses to continue to grow in those communities. These are just a few uh, small lists of various banks that you can support in the area, or at least in Virginia, Maryland, DC, um, Industrial Bank out of DC, One United Bank, I think it's the largest bank, black bank in the country. I think it's based out of Boston, but they have branches around the country. Um, you know, everything moving pretty much to online. Most folks don't go to a bank. You can put all money with ATMs. There's very little issue uh, if you use even an ATM, uh, ATMs anymore. A bank out of uh, Maryland. Broadway Federal is out of Los Angeles. Uh, City First Bank is out of D.C. And I think those two just merged Broadway Federal, which is a public state bank. Uh, Virginia State Credit is us another one. Paper. We have to put our money where our mouth is. Um, many of us do have banks. And if you don't work with banks anyway, it's all well good. Keep on your mattress, keep your deposit, what you need to do. But for those who deposit within banks, Let's switch them over from SunTrust, from Wells Fargo, from Bank of America to some of these banks and help to build up the credit and the deposits in those banks so they can invest more in us. The next thing we need to do is buy and invest in land, property, real estate. I am a fifth generation farmer, as I've stated, and the property that my family bought 100 years ago has increased in value, I would dare say, almost a thousand fold, maybe a million fold, at least 10,000 fold at least. My great great grandfather, great great grandparents uh, bought our land in 1910 for $722. My great grandfather bought his land in 1915 for $250. Both those properties, the, the larger one is probably well over a million dollars in value now. And the one in the other smaller property, about 25 acres, is probably closer to $500,000 in value right now. Well, I said at least $150,000, $200,000 in value right now. What other investment could you have made in 1910 that in 100 years would be valued that much? There's no investment in Jordans, in any type of vehicle, would it be a Tesla, a Cadillac Escalade, a Rolls Royce, none, nothing, none of those. Trinkets are going to be able to provide you a residual income. None of those things are going to hold value. Those are not assets. They're trinkets. It's the same thing that happened to us when we were sold here. 
individuals traded trinkets for us. There's no talking on this now. Who are the fruit of that trade? Got a bad deal again. Put some spoons, some mirrors, some if you have any value then it have any We've got to learn from the state of answers. Not to trade the value that we have, would it be in our money and our time, and our, our time really. Because money is nothing but a realization of your, of your time. It's a tool that's traded for your time. You work your job for eight hours a day, they give you X amount of dollars for your time. And you turn that time into shoes, clothes, perfume and colognes, foods, et cetera. You know, you, you want to buy out the bar. You know, and I'm, I may be dating myself. Uh, back in my day, it was past the basket. You know, and that's I me. Mean, amount of capacity that, that's worth not investing in land, property, real estate, especially in rural areas. Don't look at your, your cities, cities over general, and they're not going to give you the same value or the same amount of money in D.C. right now, less than probably $500,000. And as far as raw land, you know, find it. But if you go to Zillow and some of these other places uh, that, that provide realestate.com, realtor.com, you can find, you know, in the county, which is outside of the county, per se, but the rural areas you find an acre for five thousand dollars, an acre for thousand dollars. Buy your freedom. Buy something that's going to be an asset that's going to live a lot longer than you will. And this is a copy of the deeds of my grandparents, my great great grandparents, and my great great grandfather. Just so you know, I won't sell them whoop tickets. This is from the one on the left is from 1913, which says my great grandfather purchased the property for $722.05. Uh, and you see the date on that was, uh, I'm trying to find the date, but it should be oh, November 10th, November 5th, 1910. Jeff, and, Jeff Shirley and Catherine Shirley, my great great grandparents. And to the right, is my deed from my <clears throat> paternal John Lewis Carter and his land for $207.50 in 1915. Our history, they didn't sacrifice whatever they needed to sacrifice in that time period, 10 1915, just have a sell land in 2020. That land is worth something. Keep it and for, for as many generations as possible. It's still in your children to keep it. Do not sell it. Because individuals are coming to buy land, especially with the stimulus things and the PPP loans and the USDA money that's been given out. White farmers got a whole lot, lot of money. They got $15,000, $20,000, $30,000 that the USDA gave them for maintaining their farm. And they don't, they're looking for more land. And they're looking to buy it from individuals who don't know anybody. So after they invest and buy a couple more AR-15s and buy all the, all the ammo in the store, then they go out and, to the auctions and buy property. While we're here, we got to maintain that same reality. Next thing we got to do is know our story. We all got one. You know, say stories are like assholes. Everybody got one, right? And you know, knowing our story, you got to understand, you know, where you came from, and, and find some pride in it. This young lady here on the right, on the left rather, is my great grandmother's grandmother, Courtney Ellis. And to the document to the right, the slave inhabitants schedule. 
That was how they took the census of the enslaved Africans in this country, or at least in the county of state of Virginia, the county of Orange, where my family, part of course, my family was from. And if you look to the right of this document, there's a gentleman, we see R-O-B-T Ellis, Robert Ellis. He was her, I'm assuming, presuming that he was her quote unquote slave owner. And somewhere in these numbers is how she's listed. They don't give us the dignity of a name. They don't acknowledge our sex, our gender, anything. They just have us as a name and a number. And that number was not a social security number, it was just an age that they could now put value to according to what they felt your service was as a male or female enslaved person. But this is part of my story. This is what our reality was June 22nd, 1860. And many of us have these same stories. And we gotta find a level of not shame, but pride that we grew out of this, that the seeds that were planting in her are now us. The seeds that were planting in them are now us of not giving up or persevering. I've tried my hand at repatriating in Africa and I realized the biggest thing that I didn't have was a story. Individuals without a country, without a nation. We didn't have a story that we could be proud of and hold our heads to. Yet living in Ghana, everybody knew their story. They knew the history of their family, of their people, whether you were Airway, whether you were Fonti, whether you were Khan, whether you were Hausa, you knew your story, you knew your people, you knew your hometown, you knew your language. They robbed us of all of that. And we've had to create and continue to create. And we got to do more research to find out more about those stories and lift up our ancestors and, our, and, and that legacy because they are our driving force. They should be our fuels for achieving our goals. You know, I'm going to mention this later on, but they had an African dream before they came here. And instead of us living out an American dream, we need to really focus on living out this African dream. And I encourage each and every one of you all to take a spiritual pilgrimage to Africa. Wherever your heart drives you, calls you, wherever, you do like they come to and just spend a global point. But find a place to go. Ghana's a great place to go. Senegal is a great place to go. West Africa is a great place to start because they still have a connection with us as their long lost brothers and sisters. East Africa, that you know, is a great place as well, but the connection isn't there because their slave trade took us into different places and their understanding of that slave trade is not as known. So, you know, we have a lot of nuances, a lot of shared experiences with the coast of West Africa. Um, and while I just kept, I definitely believe the slave trade was definitely real. <laughs> when you go into those slave dungeons in Cape Coast, when you go to slave dungeons in Accra, when you visit those places, you feel how strong, how militant, how whatever you think you might be, you walk into those places and you realize there's some, there's an energy there that you can't deny. And that's the energy of those enslaved Africans, those kidnapped Africans who were captured and brought up against their will and marched down from wherever they lived to the coast, you know, 200, 300 miles at some time, at some points, having to walk through the bush, the woods, the jungle, barefoot, with, as I often say, with this much food and this much water a day. We often start our understanding of our story at the middle of the passage. But if you have a middle passage, you gotta have a beginning of that passage. And we've got to acknowledge those ancestors who endured the beginning of that whose names we'll, we'll never know, whose history we'll never understand, whose culture we may never, never have any conception about because many of our people were exterminated. Their cultures were exterminated. Their villages were raped. These were just original Ghanaians, original Ivory Coasters, not the, not the larger tribes or ethnic groups and nations name 
in the 1500s or the 1300s or the 800s. But those original individuals who maintain a different spirituality than what we even know as Yoruba or Khan uh, and some of these other things, you know, they were, say, conquered, but they were their cultures were usually merged into the larger dominant culture of that community at that time. So, you know, again, exploring our story, we need more of us to explore those stories. We all got them. They're like assholes. Figure them out. Look for them. And them. You know, and, and share them. That's one thing that we all should do. We all shouldn't share our ass, but you should share your story. We all got the opportunity to now share our stories. It's not funny, Devon. I thought that was funny. I'm sorry. I lied. I talked to myself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to share my story now. Okay. Again, the next thing we need to do after that is live out our African dreams and vision. We all got a dream or a vision. You know, I've been blessed. I think Brother Manifest, Brother Ron has been blessed. Some of us had that boldness, that audaciousness. Something comes to your mind, you just go ahead and you got to get it done. You don't care what the, what it is that comes to mind, what, it, what vision it is, what dream it is that you have. You have to get it out of you get, and, and do it. And I think happening in natural day is a reflection of that. And I would definitely say that my experiences of living in Ghana. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> Got a racist signal. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Hey, can you hear us? Yes, I yep. can hear you. I can hear Yay. you. Give okay, us wait, we can't hear you that well. Let's turn this All on. right, I think we're good now. All right. Hi. Hey, hey, uh, uh, Fancy, give us 15 hey. minutes. Give us 15 minutes to finish out this presentation, then I'm going live with y'all, okay? Sounds cool. good. Okay, cool. Hi, Fancy. <laughs> Hi, get you back on the, um, uh, how to get your screen back to sharing. I don't know. It, it said it was, but let me see. Okay. Uh, there you go. You're not seeing it on your end? Okay, there you go. Let me. Marja? Marja? Okay. Marja? Okay. Good. Now you back up. All right. Sorry about that. Go. There you go. So, so living out these African dreams uh, is essential. I mean, whatever the creators put in our soul, to push out whatever the ancestors have put in our soul to create, we got to share. And that's what drew me back here. When my father came to visit me on my last, his last sojourn to Africa. You know, he, he told me, he, you know, come on back. You know, take over the farm. Nobody else is going to be able to do it. And once I once I heard him, I understood what he was saying because I heard Africans saying that all the time. My father said, "Come home," and you could never re disrespect your parents in terms of not responding to that call. And that call was such a deep call because at that time I was building a home there, I was building a little community there. And one of the things that the Masons that I was working with, at least one of the workers that were, was laying I was on that I was building upon was stating that in 40 years, this would be ours again. He was counting down the time of the end of our lease because as a non ghanaian at that time, I couldn't own the land. I could only lease it for 50 years. And I dragged my feet for the first 10 years. So I was down to 40, 42 years, somewhere in there. And he was just waiting for us to finish up with that land so he would be able to take it over. His children would be able to take it over. And I said, oh, my goodness, this is nuts. <laughs> Pretty much platinum on us at this point. And I'm like, I got land here in Virginia that I need to really deal with that I don't have to worry about anybody plotting on it. And as I, again, went into the history of that and you know, really shared it with my family, they could understand, I could understand more about why that called.
I'm just going to run on these, uh, my cell phone here. Uh, I'm just going to run my cell phone here and not um, do the share the screen anymore, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah. The, and the next thing we got to do is be healthy. You know, it's critical for us to be healthy. You know, as our brother Chadwick, 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 as <laughs> okay, which one do you want me to mute? The phone or the uh, video? Talk. All right, boom. That's it. You have to let one of them go, either the video or the, or the phone. Yeah, the the laptop's gonna give me the issue. So, okay, is that better? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, sorry about that. I live in the woods, and uh, this is the price I pay for living in the woods. Very <laughs> poor internet, but I got land, so I, I can't. <laughs> I'll, yeah, right. I'll sacrifice that day to week. Trade off is like okay. Well, I got some acres. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I got my 40 acres in a mule and then some 40 acres in a John Deere. Yeah, so um and say the next thing is just being healthy, you know, picking out what we want to have in our spaces physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, you know, you know, taking those social media breaks, uh just media breaks in general. Um the news is not the news, it's the blues. And it's a new age blues. It ain't, it ain't no longer like B.B. King and Johnny Blue Bland and all them. It's a new age blues that really affects our, our nervous system. And we've got to be mindful. If we're, on, if we're being assaulted. Our nervous system is being assaulted. As we, I mean, this time, this time last week, we were, were about to see another killing. This time last week, we were about to see another killing of another innocent black man. And it seems like every month there's a new one. Uh, and they're feeding upon our sensory skills, sensory health, our nervous system health. That causes us need a desire to be more self-medicated. So staying healthy mentally, physically, emotionally is critical for us to, to one of those things that we need to do. Um, the next thing we need to do is invest in stocks of companies we regularly use. You know. We've got to figure out how to make our money grow for us. Many of us may have savings or may not have savings, uh, but we go to certain places on a regular basis. We have favorite institutions that we support that are most likely publicly traded. Would it be Amazon? Would it be Walmart? Would it be Chipotle? Would it be McDonald's? Would it be um, whomever? Uh, Tesla, Apple, Samsung. They're all the public, publicly traded companies that we can now benefit from our patronage, you know. And now with apps like Robinhood and some other apps, you can buy percentages of shares. You ain't gotta buy the whole, you know, $3,500 per share of Amazon. You can put up $30 a week, you know, to buy a portion of that. So when you make those orders this week, you can actually be paying yourself through the value of that stock. You know, we, again, it's one of those things where I, mean, I, I grew up in an area where it said, scared money, don't make no money. And a lot of us want to make sure that we, you know, I'm making the money, especially for the next legacy, next generation. And I just, I think back to this 2008, you know, 12 years ago, Amazon stock was at $30, $40. Go check the Amazon stock now in 2020. It's 30 <laughs> Three thousand some odd dollars per share. Mm. You know, a three hundred dollar investment back in two thousand eight again would give you thirty thousand dollars now. Mm. Mm. If you had bought Tesla back last year, this time when it was two hundred dollars, Tesla was trading up until the end of this week at almost two thousand dollars a share. Mm. 
And then the stock split as of this week, or I think today, tomorrow, next day, or maybe Tuesday, where they're going to turn that, you know, if you had it at 10 shares, now you have 50 shares. And the price is going to rise back up again. This is how you maintain wealth for your family. This is how you grow wealth and legacy for your family financially. Where you can have that support like we saw with a whole lot of other folks who didn't have to worry about going back to the office during the COVID reality. Forget it. I ain't got to go back. I can live off a few stocks for a couple months. I'll be all right. I mean, if we're going to be here, we got to play that game. And like any game that we played of theirs, we generally know how to play it well. After a couple tries at it, we figured out how to master it. You know, and you can't show one game that we ain't taking over to the point that they're creating new games. And you see cornhole championships on ESPN and Spartan race championships. They had to create new games to keep us out because we mastered the games that they've done before. Well, finances... The dollar, capitalism is all a game. We can master that the same way. And I mean, it's nothing like mastery and then having, you know, six, seven, eight figures behind your name. You get a whole nother type of appreciation when you go to the bank, you know, Mr. Carter, glad you came by. You, I mean, you know, we've got to invest in those things in gold, silver, in addition to stocks and ourselves. Don't be scared to invest in yourself. One of the next things we need to do is be a positive influence to our children. You know, I don't know if we understand what that always means at times, but we got to be what that great uncle was to us that showed us the way, that, that, that said the right things to us to change our direction or our course, especially when you're dealing with teenagers. You know, I grew up, fortunately enough, in a community of Black men. I didn't know too many individuals who didn't have fathers in my community. I didn't have fathers who were actually engaged. Even their parents weren't together, they were there. And I didn't realize till I got much older how valuable that is to be brought up, especially. <laughs> Phrases. <laughs> I'm going outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll try this now. <laughs> Sorry about that. But having an opportunity to grow up with black men and black women and communities where you could talk to your auntie about, you know, issues you're having and your uncle about issues you're having, you know, we've got to learn how to mine our most valuable resources, our ancestors. Our ancestors are here for a very short period of time, but they have some wisdom that we can't always appreciate, but we need to hear it. We need to get that information from them. Um, we've got to you know, do some other things with our families, uh, create traditions beyond just what society gives us. You know, if you celebrate Christmas, if you're Muslim and you celebrate Ramadan, even if you're Pan-Africanist and you celebrate, you know, Kwanzaa and Juneteenth, create some family traditions beyond just the cultural mainstream things. You know, we go out August 20th, August 21st, we go out to our, for lack of a better term, our family's plantation. Shirley Plantation, the oldest plantation in Virginia to go, you know, pay homage to our ancestors uh, around the time of the first time that our ancestors came here as enslaved Africans. You know, there's nothing written in the book. I don't post nothing about social media about it. This is something that we can do as a family and my children can now appreciate the value of this history. Uh, again, it's critical for us to kind of take ownership of our story, our history and our experiences and not allow others to shape it and influence it. Whether it be Pan-Africanists, whether it be pro-Black, whether it be various spiritual institutions, create your own. They're much more valuable and they're gonna be longer lasting and effect, uh, have a much greater effect on your family, your family, community and your legacy than just going with the flow of whatever community you're a part of. Would it be the American community, the African Hebrew community, uh, Al-Sara Set community, you know, the UNIA community? You'll find pickups in those communities. You'll find fringes, you'll find breakups, you'll find disappointment. But if you start doing things for yourself, they have, you know, as much as you may disappoint yourself, you can still keep those things at core. 
you know, so you don't throw away your traditions, your values, because you created your own. You're not depending upon anyone else for anything else. You know, we, we've kind of utilized a lot of these social movements, these African centered social movements, as our crutch to still not be who we need to be as individuals. As, you know, we can be a part of a great community, but we also have to be great individuals. And we have to find value in that as well. We cannot, you know, substitute, you know, the American way or, or Christianity or whatever thing we're running away from for someone else's thing. We gotta create our own thing. And because my laptop is inside and I don't know where I was going to next, I'm gonna go ahead and end it right here. <laughs> Uh, thank for you. any questions or dialogue for sure uh and do we have any questions on the social media hey so um you know y'all can feel free if y'all tuned in on the social media y'all can chime in in the comments with questions and thoughts and we'll post them or, or we'll we'll ask the questions of the folks that are presenting you know what i mean um as swiftly as we can uh get the, get, get the insight get get the questions up i mean i don't know uh, so you know we're kind of figuring this out, uh, there's some methods uh, where we get the questions on so Facebook. We got questions, we got people on Instagram. Oh, okay, so there's a question, uh, where are you located uh, in Virginia? I'm in Orange County, Virginia, uh, which is in between Charlottesville and Fredericksburg, okay. in the Piedmont area, uh, near Mount Peria and uh, what's the other place? Monticello. Okay. So there was a whole lot of presidential slave holding around these parts. So, 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 uh, if you're on Twitter, um, we might not be able to see your, your questions right at this moment, but we'll get back to you with them. Um, my, 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 my question for you, uh, uh, Michael is, um, uh, you know, you, and I've had lots of conversations about um, African crops. Mm -hmm. so a little, just to talk a smidge about that, and then we're gonna go ahead and um, <laughs> introduce, um, introduce Bob to, to, to the family. I mean, when I say a smidge, I mean give, give you know some to give folks something to eat you on, you know, as it relates to. Um, I, I got. You. I'm sorry, I got caught up in other stuff. I forgot what I actually do. <laughs> 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 My bad. <laughs> so this is a, let me see if I can get this. Um, this is one of the main crops I grow here. Uh, it's in some cultures, or in Ghana, it's called Inca turmeric. In uh, probably the Caribbean, they call it, call it cocoa yam, cocoa yam leaf. In Hawaii, they call it poi. Other areas, they call it taro. Uh, I'll show you another one as well. Uh, these are some of the things that we grow here um, for the African market. We also grow hot peppers, okra, uh, green called managu, which is out of West Africa, uh, East Africa. Um, so within, you know, Africulture, we grow specialty African vegetables. Uh, living in Africa for five years, I ate what the Africans ate because that's what we had to eat, you know. So uh, there I was growing like kale and broccoli and cabbage and selling it to a niche market in Accra, Ghana. Um, and when I returned back to the United States, I saw the same opportunity on this side, just in reverse, of uh, being able to grow these vegetables that you can't get here in the United States, uh, but that individuals want badly. Um, so there in Ghana, I was growing super orange sweet potato. They had a sweet potato that was white. Um, but there was a lot of African-Americans there and other folks there who was like, okay, we want sweet potatoes, we want collards, we want kale. Cool. So we grow that. And we made, you know, we were able to develop a niche market on that side. And for any farmer, a niche market is by far your, be your best market. And a niche market just means a very customized market for a very customized people. Uh, so I work with farmers throughout the state in growing these niche vegetables of what we call garden eggs, uh, scotch bonnet peppers or hot peppers, um, the taro leaf, uh, kalaloo or amaranth. Um, and we grow these things. And I definitely encourage, not as for us to grow it, but us to change our palate to start 
eating and consuming these things. I think that's one area that I'm sure we don't consider as much. And we've had to wait for somebody else to come, kind of, kind of share this with us of eating for our geographic type. Africans should be eating African foods, foods that are ideally grown in Africa. Um, you will see a different countenance in your body, a different level of health when you eat these foods. Uh, when you go into Africa, you will see individuals who are very strong, healthy, uh, who don't who don't age much, who don't have wrinkles, who are not affected as much by the sun. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the food they eat. Um, and we can prepare it in our own special ways. Uh, when I was in Ghana, we would have ground nut soup or um, kanti and kwan, which is peanut butter soup. Uh, and so outstanding. I mean, I absolutely love peanut butter soup, but we have it with cornbread. Just because it was something familiar to us in terms of what we were still used to, and they grew their corn, and we had, you know, corn flour, as they called it, instead of cornmeal. We make our cornbread to go along with the Nkanti and Kwan, the peanut butter soup. Um, you know, when, so when you're having these vegetables, and I, you know, and I didn't talk about any of these vegetables, but there are a lot of nutritional values to these vegetables uh, that are cancer preventing, uh, health increasing. Uh, the turmeric has a, I'm going to see if I can get you a picture real quick. Um, this turmeric has what's called oxalic acid in it. When I break off one of these leaves, I'm gonna take off one of these smaller ones here. But you know, white liquid that comes out of here. It didn't happen this time because it's, it's on camera, so it was not trying to. So the oxalic acid uh, doesn't allow it to be eaten raw. Uh, but it's, you know, to me, from what I've heard or read in ways, it's kind of like cyanide for the cells. That this oxalic acid helps to fight off other things in your body. Uh, but you have to cook it. So if you eat it raw, it'll irritate or scratch your throat. Um, if, if you pluck it raw and the white stuff gets on your fingers or hands, it'll make your hands itch. And it's the same thing that's found in cassava as well. Uh, and I think it's called neutrilicide, vitamin B17. And if you look at vitamin B17, you'll see it in apricot seeds as well. And that's what one of the constituent, constituent uh, ingredients of fighting various cancers is vitamin B17, which you find in apricot kernels. Um, you'll find, you know, sour sap leaf, which grows profusely in West Africa as well, uh, that is used to treat cancers. Um, and you find that a lot of individuals don't really engage in cancers or other illnesses until they engage in the Western diet. And guess what? All of us Black Americans, no matter how black, pro-Black we are, we engage in a Western diet. Vegan or not, you know, vegetarian or not, halal or not, it's all a Western diet. And we had to change what we eat and how we eat, uh, and which is a tremendous impact upon our health, short-term and long-term. Um, and we talk about breaking these generational, generational curses. This is the biggest one and usually the hardest one to break is the generational curse of bad health because we didn't always have this. This is a newfound occurrence. Generally, the enslaved Africans outlived their masters by two or three generations. Hmm because of our diet, our understanding of the diet and importance. Even we had, when we had to eat scraps, we didn't eat a lot of it. You know, you might have had a, sli a sliver of chitlins. We didn't have a bowl full. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, because we look at gran grandma, we say, you know, and I hear it all the time from my family, uh, you know, you know, grandma, she, great grandma, she lived to be 95. You know, her sister lived to be 99. I'm like, what, well, if you understood how they ate before they got into this modern age, they didn't eat much food. They eat chicken once a week on Sundays. They ate fish when they caught it. They didn't have nitrate. You know, they didn't eat ground beef like that. They made a raised cattle, but they didn't eat it beef often. So it, it's one of those nuances of our culture that we have to really explore and, and mine out in terms of what's killing us, uh, how we're eating, because the food that we're eating now is not what our great grandparents ate. The food that we are eating now, no matter where it's coming from, is highly processed. It's highly affected by our environment. Uh, the nutritional value that the of the grass that the cow eats now is much lower than it was when our ancestors ate it. You know, you, you bring up a good you bring up a good point about plant based diets for uh, African people, right? You mm -hmm. know, well, I was talking to an elder. We was talking about it, and it made so much sense. It's like, yo, you know. You only had so many pigs, 
if you if yep. you had land, right? You know what I mean. You only had if you lived on the plantation, you didn't have a pig that you owned, right? Nope. But if you once out of the after 1865, if you had some land, it didn't. It wasn't like you could eat pig every, every day. day. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like you could eat cow every day because this is the animal that you would raise from from a from a from a cow or you know a whatever the baby pig a piglet a piglet a piglet, yeah, a piglet <laughs> to, 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 to a large pig you know what I mean and then if you did eat it well when you killed it you had to slaughter you would try to preserve the meat. And so the, mm-hmm. that's where all that, you know, salted pork and all that type of stuff came from, right? Mm-hmm. So if you had that one pig that you slaughtered and it was shared amongst whoever was in the neighborhood or in your area, you know, that chitlin might have been like a festive situation yeah. where you actually like, we slaughtered this 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 one pig that we had, mm-hmm. you know, or a couple of pigs that we had and now this as this event, we have this chitlin stuff. You know, same thing with the chickens. It's like you can't kill the chickens because you got to eat the egg because you eating the eggs. It's like so if yep. you kill all your chickens, then where you get your eggs from? You know what I'm saying? Yep. So this is so so we we the way we're eating, we're eating as if we were luxurious. We're eating very luxuriously, considering what our ancestors, you know, that lived that 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 exist that that lived after you know or during on the plantation or after the plantation eating mm-hmm. meat every day is a is a freaking luxury it's like you like I, i'm sure our great great grandparents would be like you know our that, great 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 grandparents would be like wow they're eating they eat steak every day like they, they eat high on the hog <laughs> eating high on the hog right <laughs> that's where the phrase comes from that's could eat a hog every day right so you know, they, they were explaining that we ate mostly greens man we ate we eat the vegetables that we grow and we grew and that was more accessible to us so as a result you might have had a little bit of meat but it was like you had mostly vegetables and rice you know and that's what you see in in africa even today is like you'll see these soups and they had these little pieces of meat inside you know and you know so you (laughs) you're eating mostly vegetable soup with a little piece of goat meat and what we would consider to be more fat back than anything else right it's right. not even like a big old. Ch- it's not like chili with all this meat just oozing all over the place. Every right. spoon, right? You know, so even then in Africa, we didn't do it in the same manner of gorging ourselves. This is solely an American or even a Western idea and, and way of eating, and it's having a very negative effect on our health, right? Uh, yeah. On our families, uh, and then on our, our vitality mm-hmm. and virility mm-hmm. on both sides, right? Creating oh. fibroids and sisters and low sperm counting men. Right. Powerful stuff. So look, man, look, I gotta go. I'm a, I'm I wanna bring on my sister. Um, because I know she's been waiting. Uh, I told her that she was gonna get on here. So we're gonna get on here with her and then I'm gonna bring on Leah. Uh for sure. Uh, you know what I'm saying? For sure. Thank you so much for your time, brother. I appreciate you coming in and dropping this. So profoundly with us today. This was that was a nice step by step. Uh, what we need to do. What we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> we need more of those conversations. But uh, I'll be in touch with you, man. We'll see. Uh, I'll oh. talk to you later. And uh, thank you for supporting Happily National Day, man. No, always a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Where we at? Hey. Look hey. At <laughs> Thanks for coming by. Hey. Hey.